pop up just now. Uh, please make sure to click the various approvals that may pop up on your screen. Um, Real quick uh, little plug for RGSQ, we do have a number of events coming up over the next several weeks, including our public lecture at the start of August, both online and in person on agriculture and AI, and as well as our Geography Matters uh, a little bit later in August, looking at Mount Isa. Uh, we also have some ongoing citizen science work. Uh, please check our website and our notifications if you would like to see more about that. At Likewise, membership, as always, is a fantastic opportunity and you can sign up through our website as well. Nonetheless, though, let's get started. Let's get into this talk tonight on Is Queensland Going Batty? We are joined tonight by Tyron Decor from the Sunshine Coast Council. Uh, Tyron has significant experience with flying foxes in, in the region and has been part of the Sunshine Coast Flying Fox Management Program. As well with us tonight is Dominique Thierry, uh, who has a background in science, administration, law and politics, and has been a flying fox rescuer, carer and advocate in North Queensland for more than 50 years. With that, we'll throw to Dominique to provide us with a bit of background and get the conversation started. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, John. Let me share my screen. Can you see that? Your screen is up now, thanks. Beautiful, okay, excellent. Well, first I'd like to start um, with acknowledging the Bindal people, uh, the traditional custodians of the land on which I stand tonight. And I pay my respects to their elders, uh, past, present and emerging. So who would be better to speak about whether Queensland is going batty that someone is completely batty herself? So I will start the conversation then. So the area we're talking about tonight is um, not exactly a diamond. I guess it's probably more like a rough diamond. Um, that's the area of North Queensland that is between Ingham in the north, Townsville, the Burdekin, um, including Home Hill and Charterstairs um, West. The reason we're focusing on that region is because there's been there's lots of flying fox colonies in that area, and there's been a lot of dispersals. It's been a real hot spot of dispersals in the last um, few decades. <clears throat> the two main species which are subject to the dispersals in those areas are the little black, the black flying fox and the little red flying fox. And for those of you who are not used to seeing flying foxes too close and you don't know what they look like, um, you know, like this, I'm turning them the other way for you, so that might be a bit easier for to see what they look like the wrong way around. There are also in Ingham two other species um, which I won't talk about because they're pretty rare in that area, but it's the spectacle flying fox and the grey-headed flying fox. So we can't really look at this small area of North Queensland unless we actually look at the whole context. Um, and we really need to have a look at the distribution of those species. You can see they have a very wide distribution, especially the little red flying fox on the right-hand side. However, it doesn't just simply mean that there are lots of flying foxes in those areas. Basically what it means um, when we're talking about flying foxes is that each flying fox is likely to perhaps in its lifetime travel that whole area. They travel an enormous amount of, you know, an enormous distance. So for example, um, I'm having problems with my slides here, just a sec. So um, the study by Welberg and, um, and colleagues about the mobility of the flying foxes, you can see on the map on the left-hand side, there's a little patch here um, which actually shows flying foxes moving from Ingham, um, Townsville, Charter Stairs, and the Burdekin. So they're quite mobile in that area. And then on the right hand side, um, the red line indicates the movements of a single flying fox along the northern Queensland um, coast. It's quite extraordinary um, the distance that this flying fox is covering. In fact, Sorry, this is going too fast. Um, 
And here I just wanted to show you really, really quickly the, um, how those little flying foxes, little red flying foxes can move in that area. So it's impossible, as I said, to look at the Townsville area or that tiny little part of North Queensland without realizing that those flying foxes travel a lot. Not as cooperative as it should be. So flying foxes, you can see very well from, from you know, those graphs that flying foxes are really the ultimate nomads. They travel thousands and thousands of kilometers, particularly the little red flying fox, which travels up to 6,000 kilometers a year, which is quite extraordinary. And for this reason, they're, they're considered to be the most mobile mammal on earth. It's a, it's a pretty amazing, um, amazing thing to do. And each roost is considered to be, you know, a bit like a youth hostel or a backpacker because the flying foxes are just simply using those roosts as um, staging posts. They move around from one area to the next. And basically the turnover is so high that on, on any given night, you never know, you know how many of those are going to stay the following, the following night again. So why so much traveling? Well, I guess perhaps they just like traveling. Perhaps they just like to go and catch up with friends in other parts of the country. Um, but for us, the most logical explanation would be that they are you know, traveling so much because they're trying to follow the blossoms. And species, native species, uh, particularly the myrtaceas, um, eucalypts, melaleucas, cyzygiums, things like that, and flowers at all kinds of different times of the year. So it would make sense that there would need to be you know, moving around to follow those blossoms. And same thing for fruiting. Figs, you know, lily peelings, things like this will be flying, uh, fruiting at different times of the year. So in doing this, in traveling so much and dispersing uh, um, seeds and pollinating, they can do that over great distances. In fact, um, I think it's been said that a single bat can um, um, spread about 60,000 seeds over about a you know, 50 kilometer distance overnight. So imagine what hundreds of thousands of those little, little bats can do in terms of um, ecology, you know, ecosystem uh, services. Because of their pollination and, and seed dispersal, they're absolutely crucial to the health of our rainforest and our savannas. And this is why they're considered to be keystone species. That is a species that is so important that it, if it disappeared, it might actually um, you know, have some important repercussion for the health of the whole ecosystem. Of course, it's not something that's going to happen overnight, but if um, flying foxes were not there to pollinate and pollinate in, on great distances, it's quite possible that a lot of our forests and our trees that depend on them would disappear over time. Again, not something that's going to happen overnight, but it's something that we need to be aware of. We also need to be aware that flying foxes and their, you know, the plants that they're relying on can be, um, you know, quite um, impacted by climatic events. For example, cyclones, droughts, floods. Um, you know, bushfires, and in fact, after a, a pretty severe cyclone in North Queensland, far North Queensland, you know, some years ago, um, the flying foxes had actually disappeared from, from that area for quite some time before they came back, because basically there was really nothing else to eat. So ecological role is extremely important. So when flying foxes are not traveling, looking for food, they basically um, sit during the day or hang during the day um, in a roost or sometimes they're called camps. And one of the questions that's been asked is how do they actually choose um, where they're going to be hanging around, where they're going to be roosting? Um, some research has been done on that by McDonald's and, and colleagues and trying to identify some factors um, which indicate that an area that might be a good place for flying foxes to hang around. Um, you can see proximity to feeding resources. That makes sense. They don't want to go too far to feed if possible. It needs to be reasonably green with a bit of canopy structure and canopy cover. Uh, proximity to open water, particularly you know, in summer when it's hot, they might want to have a bit of a drink. 
um, avoiding of climatic extremes and being, you know, um, not too exposed to wind or, or heat. The presence of other bats is very important. Obviously, they're incredibly social animals. They don't want you by themselves. And also quite um, likely a pretty strong memory of past use. However, the authors have also identified that there probably are some other factors that we know absolutely nothing about, which would um, indicate that a place is a good place for a flying fox roost or perhaps not a good place for a flying fox roost. So there's a lot of question marks for us still to, to try to answer. If you look at um, this map of um, Charles Towers on Google Earth, you can see um, in the middle, there's a little green spot here, which is Listener Park. And this is really where um, there's a big colony of flying foxes there, which is quite famous, well, infamous, I should say. Um, but in the middle of that big brown landscape, it's not surprising that the flying foxes would walk. It's the people who are pretty unhappy about the flying foxes. You can you can get the drift. be negligible unless you actually touch the flying foxes that are not going to happen. So the solution to living next to a colony that um, is causing problem is very simple. Basically, all you need to do is move them somewhere else, right? Um, and this is the question that people often ask when they're being interviewed, why can't the council actually move them somewhere else? Like, we don't want them here, let's move them along. And it's very simple, you just chuff them on. <laughs> In fact, um, there's quite a lot of techniques that have been used to disperse colony or, or move them on. Um, this slide here uh, lists, is actually a list from the um, Charles Tales Regional Council about dispersal techniques that have been used for moving flying foxes. You can see the absolutely amazing number of, of, um, of options for moving flying foxes. And I just wanted to show you um, a few of those, but before I do, um, it's important to note that, you know, the council next to that beautiful list, impressive list of techniques, actually says they have tried a variety of activities over the last 17 years to disperse the bats with varying degrees of success, but ultimately none has worked. Um, so let me be clear that this list that I've just shown you is not a list of techniques that could be used. It's the list that have been used in Charles Downs. Quite a lot of different things. So, just showing you a few examples. So this is the fog that's being used that's, uh, that's in Charter's Towers. Um, not entirely sure what the fog is made up of, um, although we've been assured that it was safe for the bats. Uh, you can see this is um, the colony dispersal in, in full action with the flying foxes flying around there. Um, this is an example of the noise, so the bird flight. And in the background, you have someone who's uh, clapping uh, noodles just to make noise for you know several hours at a time. This is the beautiful blue light of the flying fox colony in Townsville. Um, I don't think it um, has any impact on the flying foxes, um, but it looks very beautiful at night. It's, it's great disco light. And then I just wanted to also show you a technique which is not a, not actually on that list, but it's the, the power techniques. So this is the home heel colony about a month ago. 
it's two hours of discussion compressed in two minutes if you just want to watch this and put the sound on. I don't know about you, but when I watch this, I feel that this is a pretty brutal way of treating our wildlife. So the question is, does it work? And the council, uh, the, the regional council in Charter Stales obviously thinks that it doesn't. They've tried for 17 years and they've concluded that um, none not of those techniques has actually worked. Um, this is confirmed by research by Roberts and uh, colleagues about dispersals on about 40, a study of 48 colonies, which indicates that basically it really doesn't work. Or certainly, you know, it might work in the very short term, but it certainly is not a solution, not a long term solution for dealing with wildlife conflict. And as they concluded, uh, camp dispersal is a high risk, high cost tool for mitigating human wildlife conflict. The cost is pretty horrendous. I think in Charter Tales, they have spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars over the, the last 17 years to actually end up with pretty much the colony still in the same place. Um, although sometimes they might disappear for a few weeks or a few months, but usually, you know, they come back and after a massive effort, effort again last year, the flying fox are back. So really it doesn't um, work. So why do they do it? As one of the land managers told me, well, we have to be seen to be doing something because the residents are complaining and they, they just can't do nothing. So here they go, get the pyrotechnics and hope for the best. Apart from being pretty expensive and not particularly uh, effective, um, it also has some impacts on quite a, you know, quite a range of, um, of flying foxes. For example, well, so if we start with communities, that noise that you've just heard, you know, will go on in some communities sometimes for two or three hours every morning for weeks, perhaps sometimes for, you know, for, for months. And it's, it would be incredibly, invasive and noisy and frightening. It's like living in a war zone, you know, dogs howling and dogs escaping because they're terrified of, of, of the fireworks. So communities can get extremely divided in, in situations like this. Obviously, it can have some impact on flying fox welfare. Some of that footage that I show you probably indicates that some of the flying foxes have been hit. Um, there's probably not an enormous amount of physical impact on the flying foxes, but certainly the stress level that would be caused from being harassed like that, you know, every single day would be pretty awful. Um, if it is done within, um, you know, the breeding season, it's also going to be um, affecting the little pups, including the one on the right-hand side that was found abandoned after, um, after a dispersal. Potentially, 
again, if it's happening in the breeding season or maybe if it isn't, the high stress level that is causing the flying foxes might have some impact on, on them in some other ways that we, you know, we don't really know. On lo other local species too, I remember one of the residents in Home Hill told me that after the dispersal, they never saw a bird for two days in the whole town after that. And of course, it might also have an impact, an ecological impact, and we really don't know exactly how that's going to affect the capacity of the flying foxes to continue pollinating and dispersing seeds, but certainly um, the disturbance is likely to have some kind of an impact at some stage. So we have um, quite a few alternative measures, um, which um, I don't particularly want to spend too much time speaking about them now. I think we can have a discussion with Taran uh, later on. But there are some ways of um, dealing with flying fox uh, colonies, which are much, much more successful than, than this. Um, and obviously, some of those techniques that I've indicated, um, for example, the roost destruction uh, can be incredibly successful if you cut down all the trees, which I've seen happen. Um, this is really going to get the roost moving on somewhere else. Um, also, taking some proactive measures is going to be pretty important, and we'll talk to, that, talk to Taran about that later. I just want to finish with um, flying fox management um, in Queensland. Basically, in the old days, uh, the Department of Environment, and particularly the National Parks and Wildlife Service, were responsible for flying fox management and you know wildlife protection generally but since 2013 and the newman um, um, law reform that power to manage flying foxes has been um, devolved to local government um, the local governments were pretty happy at the beginning to have that power because they thought the department of environment wasn't doing the right thing However, this causes a, a fair number of problems in my view. First, the local governments don't, necess not, don't necessarily have the expertise to be able to deal with flying fox issues and wildlife management generally. Often they have limited resources, they don't have you know, the resources of the, of the state government. And because we have very limited state government oversight, basically the Department of Environment has really washed its hands of flying fox management. Um, we have some real problems when each local government is deciding to do a flying fox dispersal and the flying foxes might be just sent from pillar to post and we don't know how much impact it's, this is going to have on the species and we certainly don't think this is going to be terribly effective. If flying foxes are going to be, again, harassed, you know, back and forth in lots of different places, no matter where they end up, the cumulative impacts of those dispersal also need to be considered, but local governments are incapable of doing this because they're only concerned about what's happening in their jurisdiction. So we really do need to have the state government coming back in and um, getting involved in the, um, the management and the oversight and the coordination of flying fox management in the colonies. I think I'll leave it at that and I'll just um, thank you for, for being here and um, look forward to having a bit of a chat with Tara now. Thank you very much for that, Dominic. And that's a perfect segue, um, obviously finishing off around local governments. Um, so quick introduction. My name is Tyrone DeCowie, as mentioned at the beginning. I'm the Flying Fox Management Officer for Sunshine Coast Council down in Southeast Queensland. So we're in obviously a very different region, um, different experiences, different background with this. Um, my specialty is in human wildlife conflict resolution. It certainly is by no means interviewing people, but I'm going to give it a crack. Um, so I have jotted down some things like everyone else in here, I'm a bit of a student. So I'm learning things from, from that presentation, which was wonderful. I've jotted down some questions to try and hopefully flesh out some of those things, as Dominic said, we're wanting to, to get to some of those key issues. But once again, if you do have any other questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat and we can address them straight afterwards. I did see that there's a couple of flying fox researchers, carers and other experts in the room. So I expect some incredibly curly questions that I will obviously handball over to someone else to answer. Um, but let's have a crack at this, shall we? 
So, uh, look, you definitely did outline, Dominique, that there are a number of sort of social issues that do come into play here. So, look, being being on the other side of the fence, uh, I do see a lot of these issues being at that coal face of, of when residents are impacted. They're being woken up early in the morning at dawn with flying foxes moving back into an area, trying to come back to their roost um, in the morning. And these can lead to some really serious implications. So look, I've had too many people come to me too many times and tell me their issues um, for me to just fob it off and pretend it doesn't exist. So completely acknowledging the fact that these impacts can be quite serious. So they can be, you know, sleep deprivation. Some people are FIFO workers or shift workers. So this has led to breakdowns in relationships or even suicidal ideology. So really serious issues that we're having to deal with here. Um, issues that, you know, they're not as simple. Obviously, this is a wicked problem, as you, as you mentioned, where there's not an easy solution. It seems really simple. Oh, yeah, just get rid of them, move them on. Um, but it really isn't that simple. So acknowledging all of this and understanding that flying foxes have been co-evolving in, in Australia for 23 million years, why are these social and wildlife conflict issues, what, why do they seem to be more prevalent now? And I think I probably know what your answer is going to be, but do politics and management actions play a part in this, do you think? Oh, absolutely. But I think there's probably a few reasons why those kinds of conflicts have increased, you know, over the last, whatever, a few decades. Um, one of them is land clearing, um, probably a lot of damage to the vegetation which support the flying foxes. And on the other hand, urban encroachment. So, you know, towns growing and getting closer and closer to where the flying foxes are. So the wildlife conflict, the wildlife human conflict is going to happen more often because of, because of that. Um, obviously, um, the flying foxes also, you know, probably like, um, seem to like going into urban areas. There's reliable food, um, you know, lots, lots of nice plantings, native and non-native plants. So this is also going to increase the, the, the potential conflict between the two. Um, but certainly um, the, the media has been demonising the flying foxes and taking great pleasure in demonising them. And I think the politicians have jumped on the bandwagon and have used that anger from, you know, from people. And I think particularly in the area, in the area where I live, um, you know, the whole area is cat a country basically. And uh, there is a, a, you know, a pretty good brand of conservative politics, um, which doesn't have very much room for, um, for flying foxes and for wildlife generally. So probably all those factors together would make the fact that people are, you know, much more likely, the, the conflicts are more likely to occur in the first place, but also they're likely to be made much worse and aggravated by the media, the politicians, and also I should say social media. Pe people are really um, using that as a tool to, you know, to demonise the flying foxes personally. Yeah, that's a really good point. That A couple of really good points you made there. Um, I will add to some of them, particularly in the, the habitat fragmentation. Um, you know, it, it's it's often the first thing that comes back to us as, as local government officers or more broadly as well. Oh, flying foxes have just turned up in my area all of a sudden. They weren't here when I bought. They weren't here when I came to the area. They've never been here, those sorts of comments, which which may or may not be the case in, in some instances, but... I think it does speak to what you were saying more broadly around that habitat fragmentation, whereby the reality is likely that they have been there for 40, 50,000 years. However, we have decided to move into those areas, those distribution maps that you put up earlier that demonstrated where flying foxes are and their range happens to overlap pretty well with where people like to live. Obviously, we love those coastal areas. We have large scale urban developments and that really has started to nibble away at what's available for them. So I, I think that's a really good point that you make around that and that really sort of fueling that conflict as well and, and a higher potential for it to occur because we're kind of overlapping in territories now. Can I just say too that I guess because flying fox dispersal has become more common, 
this has also caused a fragmentation of the colonies themselves. So where you used to have one large colony that was causing problems, now you might have half a dozen smaller colonies in the same area that are also causing problems. And where the flying foxes have ended up after the first dispersal uh, might be just as bad or if not worse than where they were in the first place. So it is used as a way to solve a problem, but it's basically often creating more problems in more places as well. So that increases again the conflict. Yeah, that's a really good point. And look, full disclosure, um, we, we are not patron saints in, in Sunshine Coast Council, um, although our practices have certainly changed over time. Um, as you'd mentioned back in you know, November 2013, uh, there was that big change of legislation and, and the power was absolved to our local governments to be able to manage flying foxes. Uh, a number of the issues I feel came around because of how that was managed. Um, that was before my time, um, obviously, but there was an expectation that was put on top of that as well. So whilst there was communication to say, yes, councils are able to do these things, uh, I think the expectation towards the community was that something would be done. Mm -hmm. um, but like you'd mentioned, local governments weren't provided with the resources. They didn't have the understanding, um, the funding and the knowledge base that that you know, we probably could have had if it was a more coordinated fashion. And um, yeah, personally, Sunshine Coast Council, we undertook um, several dispersals back in 2013 and 14 um, and into 2015 as well. And those exact things happened. They either came back to the exact same site or they were moved to somewhere very close by. Um, these are you know, sometimes really hard learnings to go, okay, this is expensive didn't really work at all. And if there was any reprieve, it was short term, but there are significant off target impacts that you'd mentioned. So for, you know, th these are things that we've removed from our um, primary management techniques, but I can understand how councils getting into this space, um, particularly might, might feel pressured into doing these things because it is really difficult to go, oh, I've been lumped with this. This has all of a sudden come on me, even though it might've been there for many, many years. What do I do? Well, yeah, we, we have to be doing something. I can I can completely empathise with that um, that mind frame, but it doesn't mean that it's the best way to manage it by any means. Now, you did mention the media there. Um, look, this this is definitely something. Flying foxes in general are something that are somewhat demonised. They do have a pretty bad rap. Uh, you know. The late Dr. Les Hall used to speak about how entrenched in mythology this fear was, you know, going back to Dracula and those sorts of things and and how deep and heavy this this fear has been within us for, for many centuries. But where, where do you feel this has come from? Like, especially this sort of newer wave, where is, where is this fear sort of emanated from? In Queensland, I think, that feeling that antagonism against flying foxes has been there for forever, I think. Um, probably because of the flying foxes uh, raiding crops at times um, that would have made them fairly unpopular. Um, you know, dropping off mangoes on iron roofs, <laughs> which is noisy. So there, there's a lot of, you know, of that happening, for, you know, for, from a very, very long time. Um, obviously the history and you know, the, the tales about vampires and things like this are definitely not going to help. But I guess the turning point, or at least where things have gone much, much worse, has been the, the discovery of Lysavirus in 1980, 1996, I think, um, and then Hendra virus a couple of years later. This has really caused people to get extremely frightened because I guess, you know, this is potentially an incredibly dangerous disease that no one wants to catch. Um, and thus, this has, you know, this is something that the media has really played on. It's been very easy to associate flying foxes with a fatal disease, even though the risk is incredibly low. As I said before, if you don't touch them, there's absolutely no risk whatsoever. And in my view, if you just, if you, you know, concerned about Hendra, you should stay away from horses. They are the ones that are going to cause trouble. So flying foxes are perfectly fine when it comes to Hendra virus. <laughs> yes, very good. Uh, look, I'll, I'll add one more thing on top of that as well. Um, 
from from my perspective. Uh, so a term that's that's often used, or a term that may have been used that people may have heard of, called ambiguous loss. Um, so what what we're seeing, and it does contribute to that fear or, or helplessness that a lot of people are coming to us with or or exhibiting. So ambiguous loss is is a term basically encompassing this this lack of of something, essentially like a grief. You have lost something without any formal resolution. So this obviously can be manifested really obviously when, for instance, you know, you lose your father, your brother, your mother, something like that, and you go through that grief and, it, and there is this loss. It can also be manifested in other types and, and these different avenues can be things that are valued to people, such as their amenity, their feeling of entitlement or rights or where they feel they should be able to exhibit their own behaviours and, and what is important to them. So, for instance... Bats have just rocked up in the in the park behind me. I feel like a prisoner in my own home now. I can't open the windows. I can't have people over for barbecues because it's smelly or the droppings when they fly over. So this loss is a really difficult thing for a lot of people to wrestle with. So, you know, in our positions, we have that, that position of privilege of understanding that there is this landscape picture that we're looking at. These animals fly incredible distances. They've been evolving in our landscape for millions of years. But for these people, it's just a snapshot in time. They have no understanding of where they've, where they've come from, why they've turned up, and if they're ever going to leave and when they're going to leave if they are. So the only power these people have is picking up the phone and talking to their local council or complaining to someone else. So understanding that that's, you know, that's sort of perpetuating that fear as well, which is just... I, I don't know what I can do and I feel powerless in this situation. That that was also captured in that um, that that K Curry article or the Pialantini article that you, you you'd mentioned earlier. So it certainly is something that's within that space and it's it's a, a big issue and I think it does perpetuate that that existing fear um, as well that you'd mentioned. Uh, we've got a couple more questions, so I'll dig through these because we've got probably about five or six minutes. So um, just quickly, uh, you did outline the, the species that you're seeing up there and a few management techniques, but are you any any more, um, you can give any more sort of clarity or context around the different species that we're seeing across these different areas or different management techniques um, that have been used or can be used or you would go towards in those alternatives? So the, the two species um, have been present in those colonies that I've discussed. Uh, they've been uh, sometimes present, both present at the time of the dispersal. Sometimes it was only just one of them. Um, so, you know, the, the techniques have been pretty much evolving or you know, they've tried different types of things. Um, I'm really interested in looking at alternatives, looking at how we can actually allow the, the flying foxes to remain there or at least to remain in a, in a way that they're not going to be causing quite so much uh, angst to the people. And um, the buffering is one of the things that has been done, you know, sometimes reasonably successfully, just trying to find ways of deterring the flying foxes from certain areas. Um, but we see that in, in the Townsville colony quite a lot. Um, there's a, a part of the park where the flying foxes are close to residence, which is where the flying foxes are being dispersed every single day, and they have been, you know, for years and years. And it might well keep that area free from the flying foxes, but it seems to be increasing the stress of the flying fox colony enormously. Like this colony is the most stressed that I've ever seen. It's reacting to every single nose, and it's always, always on the go, always moving. So. I don't even think that this is working because I think it would create even more stress and um, activity for the residents. But I'm really interested in, in, the, in the mitigation of impact and I think that your council actually does that quite well. So maybe that's something you might want to talk about, you know, what are the, the ways that you help the residents? Shucks, thank you for that. Appreciate the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the lovely sure. words on that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Look, in, in terms of, as I said, we, we have had a history where we had been in that really reactive space and that was, you know, that was a very different time 
um, and very, very different circumstances that came about that in terms of that really public and political push um, to be seen to be doing something. Um, my own sort of ethos or philosophy around this is control the controllable um, or manage what we think we can manage. As you'd mentioned, this species moves massive distances consistently. They have their little, as I refer to them, bat packer hostels all across the country that they are moving along. Um, we have slightly different species here. So we're predominantly having gray headed flying foxes and, and black flying foxes. We're sometimes visited by little reds over Christmas time, but we have that added level of with the gray headeds, they do have a conservation status with the EPBC Act. So they're nationally listed as vulnerable to extinction. So trying to be trying to be considerate of that and the conservation outcomes that we need to achieve in this space. So it's it's certainly a very different way to approach it. And what what I'm basically trying to do is look at the other side of the fence. So to break it back down to you know conflict management or conflict resolution like you would with any relationship there's three ways to go about it if you're having a bust up with your partner you know they tell you to take out the trash and you don't really want to you've kind of got three issues there you can either accept them for who they are and what they do which would be yeah i appreciate it flying foxes might be annoying but they've got a really important role so i'm going to leave them there or you try and do some sort of resolution you go to counselling, you speak to someone, you talk it out as a family, you try and resolve your issues. That would be going down into those management actions that we're looking at and trying to find ways in which we can minimise the impacts on people, but also not have, have any sort of conservation outcomes that are, are being negatively impacted. We're not threatening the species in any way. Or well, third one is, which you know I'll always empower people to do, you have the right to move away. You're allowed to have a breakup. It's completely fine. Sometimes it is the most empowering thing for you to do is to realise that this situation is not good for you and you need to get out of it, like any other relationship. So if every action that the councils are doing or the government's doing or whoever's doing, if it's not achieving the outcome that you want, you still have that option to just go, you know what, I'm, I'm better than this. I deserve better than this. My family deserves better than this. I can move away. It's obviously much easier said than done. So, yeah, we do definitely partner with um, research organisations, um, various researchers that are here online tonight as well. Um, they know the the amount of work we go in to try and improve the knowledge base that we have to come up with ways to mitigate the actions or mitigate the impacts for people. So ways in which we can improve their lifestyles, providing grants for them to um, double glaze their windows, for instance, uh, partnering up to try and do world first trials like um, an odor neutralizing trial as well. So other ways in which we can treat the human side of the fence, the built environment, rather than always taking, taking, taking from the natural environment. Um, I've got one more for you, Dominique, and I'll, and I'll leave you with the final words of this. Given all of these challenges and in the theme of what we're sort of talking about tonight, how do we work towards tolerance and coexistence? What's, what's the way forward? How do we affect meaningful social change here? Big question, but I'm sure you can succinctly wrap it up for me. It's a huge question, but, but I think that when we're dealing with a problem that's as complex as that, we have to have some kind of an education strategy to get people to understand the you know the constraints and and the and the solutions and the alternatives and unfortunately i think that a lot of the councils have just been trying to solve a single problem without trying to look at further you know looking at the big picture and certainly i think that in lots of situations it would be possible to engage the public a lot better um you know getting them to participate in activities and, and just to try to get over that fear and that ignorance sometimes about what, what's going on with flying foxes. So definitely public engagement, in my view, is going to be one of the most important things that we can, we can do. Couldn't agree more. And events like this are obviously going to be incredibly beneficial. Thank you, Dominique. Um, in lieu of John coming back in, I might just get cracking onto the questions that we got here. I think I'm taking over the show. Um, fortunately, we've got wonderful people coming into the chat and putting some questions. So I'm just gonna go from the top down um, and we can jump in. 
Uh, comment from Jane, we need to replicate environments as they did in Melbourne, provide replicated protected environments. Great comment, great question. Did you have anything to add to that, Dominique? I certainly have a comment I can make on that. Well, look, I think replicating the environment is, is a fantastic um, idea. Um, sometimes it's obviously not going to be that simple or that quick. It might take weeks, you know, decades before the before the place is suitable for a flying fox colony. So it might not work immediately. I also think that in the in the Melbourne Botanic Garden dispersal, there was probably a fair amount of luck that the flying foxes ended up in an area where they were just okay and you know not causing too much trouble. They could have ended up much in places that were much worse. So lucky them, they've got them in a good spot now. <laughs> yes, completely agree. I was going to make a very similar comment where, yes, look, at the end of the day, they did get a little bit lucky. It wasn't where they planned for them to go, but they did certainly go into a suitable location. Um, mm -hmm. To that end, this is 100% what I, I can speak on our behalf and, and many other councils across southeast Queensland. This is what we're looking to do. So whilst it's it's one thing to try and mitigate those impacts to residents at the location, you also have to have a long-term plan in place to try and ensure that there are areas that are highly suitable in low conflict areas or outside of the urban footprint and ensure that you either improve the quality of those, those areas for roosting and foraging um, and encourage them across there. So. It's certainly part of the long-term plan for, for our council and many other councils as well. But like you said, unfortunately, the, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is now. So it certainly does take a long time for these to get to those, um, those, really, those really good outcomes that we want and for them to be suitable for them. Um, from Lizzie here, I feel ambiguous loss when I see here of these atrocities, atrocities sorry, to wildlife. It's a heartbreaking feeling of powerlessness on this side of the fence also. Um, completely agree. I'm not sure if you want to speak to any more to that, um, Dominique. Well, I totally agree with Lizzie here. I think that um, we always talk about the residents that are impacted by the dispersals, but we don't talk about the pain that, you know, the flying fox carers and the people who love the environment suffer every time they see one of those attacks on wildlife. It's, I think it's really something that needs to go in the conversation much more than it, than it does at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And look, again, I can only speak on behalf of, of our own council. Um, we do offer before trauma season occurs every year, which is an unfortunate name for that time of year for all wildlife carers. Um, we do offer a caring for carer session. So we actually have a trained clinical psychologist that comes in and speak to them about these losses, how to deal with it. It's far more broad than just these isolated incidences of um, dispersal, even though they're not occurring in our region. Um, I do know from speaking with them that it does occur just by like releasing animals and then looking straight across and seeing wide scale development or clearing. Um, that they do feel this real visceral connection to it, um, this connection to nature, and it deeply impacts them, as as I think it does for probably most of us that are on this chat. Um, but completely agree. That's a, a excellent comment. Um, next from Kelly. More and more councils are having the same issues and go through the same patterns of using dispersals as a tool to manage flying foxes. There is now a lot of data from a large number of dispersals across Australia showing that dispersals are expensive, don't work, but yet councils are still using this activity. How could you spread the learning across the oh, across the state so councils get better informed and make better decisions? Excellent, excellent question. I'll give you a first crack at this one. Look, I think that there probably is um, a movement across the local governments to actually realise that we need a better way and, and this hasn't hit the North Queensland <laughs> area yet, but I think certainly in your area and in other parts of Australia, New South Wales and Victoria, people are now, councils are now aware that they need to be looking at alternatives. So I think the more examples we have of situations where mitigation has worked or alternative measures have worked, this is how it's going to happen. People will learn that they're just basically wasting their ratepayers' money when they look at the council. Yeah, I, I think you're right about that. And look, there is, it's, I could be incorrect about this, but I feel like it is slightly overrepresented, the number of 
um, councils that do undertake dispersal actions because it is so highly publicised whenever it happens. Um, there is, you know, I can I can certainly speak for Southeast Queensland. We have a group that we meet, um, and we we will constantly share management actions, wins, losses, learnings around how we can improve our actions. Um, I know, you know, I'm in a, again a bit of a, a space of privilege where my council has an environment levy. So that is specifically used. So, you know, as with all other levies, um, it comes in and we have a pool of funds. Part of that is used to actually improve um, environment for flying foxes, improve our education, for instance, doing an annual Australasian bat night each year and partnering with researchers to improve our understanding of both the ecology of the species and potential management actions. So we are certainly sharing those outcomes there you know most have coordinated groups or we've started to connect more more uh, more frequently um, and consistently in having open dialogues but there's also uh, the the national flying fox forum uh, in september as well where a lot of us get together and do really share those case studies so completely agree it's it's not to say that we're anywhere near perfect but definitely people are working towards it um, as above Kelly's question, particularly educating the councils and their residents about the waste of dollars and better use of the funds. Yeah, completely agree. I think we, we might have addressed that one. Um, from Mike, are there any requirements in the local planning scheme to ensure appropriate houses, human habitat in developments adjacent, in adjacent to known roosts? Brilliant question. I might jump in very quickly about this because it's something of, of um, particular um, a, a passion project of mine. And yes, I think it's an incredibly useful tool and a great idea around due diligence, basically providing with people with enough understanding and knowledge that this could be an issue and then putting it back on them to figure out whether they can or should move into a place in the first place. So similar to every other natural, natural hazard, so to speak, Flooding, fires, you can search for those things and you can choose whether you still want to live in those places or buy those houses. This should be no different. Um, and it's certainly something that we're working towards. Uh, our council has a, a bat map that we have on our website, which actually publishes the locations of all the known roost sites. Um, so in theory, if anyone does want to do their research properly, they are able to go and have a look and go, yep, yeah, okay, there's roost there. It's been there for this amount of time. These are the numbers. It's, you know, it's a pretty quick Google search these days to find out whether these impacts are something that you think you can live with or not. Um, but in terms of enshrining them into planning schemes, that's where it does become quite difficult. And it's a learning that I'm going through at the moment is really trying to understand how you can embed this in um, because there's no protections within those state planning functions. Um, those documents don't have anything at a state level. So Yes, you can sometimes make make some wins in a local scale, um, but for instance, if you know you're trying to achieve, say, a thirty metre setback, um, because you know that it'll minimise the impacts for people on flying foxes and from from flying foxes on people, you're coming against the power of of developers saying, well, that's an extra hundreds of thousands of dollars that you've lost us there, and it goes into planning an environment court and gets quite messy because you're trying to push against, um, you know, there may be impacts versus this is a known quantity. So it is a really tricky space, but I think we do still need to keep progressing in that way and, and see what we can do in that space and really start to look at future planning and future proofing instead. Um, sorry, Dominique, is there anything else you wanted to add to that? No, no, that's, that's fine. I think it, your experience is really important. Okay, from Jenny, um, Melbourne got lucky after 18 months and over $1 million plus dollars and Yarra Bend is prone to heat stress. So yes, absolutely, Jenny. Um, it's, it's, it's not the panacea, but it's, you know, it, it was fortuitous for some, for some reasons. Um, from Liz, I agree, Dom, huge and proactive efforts are needed to engage community, raise awareness and understanding, dispelling fears and myths. I doubt many, any, Local governments are doing this, would lack resources and expertise for a start. Um, DES should be working with councils to fund and provide this much needed education. Um, did you want to tack on on this? No, I 
I couldn't say it any better. We need to in that. Yeah. Look, look. By and large, absolutely, it is. It is a big gap. Um, as I said, there are some fortunate councils that are a bit well more well resourced, like myself, where we do have an environment levy. So that funding does go into specifically education. So our Australasian Bat Night, where we have events there, um, not not dissimilar to others that are around um, around the east coast of Australia as well. We get around a thousand people to those events. Um, we've created a choose your own adventure bat podcast um, that you can listen to if you like my dulcet tones um, and many other things like a board game. Um, I do school talks. We have outreach events, get our bat carers out and do library talks. So certainly these, these outreach and education events do happen on a smaller scale. Um, I probably would certainly agree with what, what Liz is saying. And whilst it's great to have these local wins, a coordinated state or even national program, um, as is recommended in the Senate inquiry from 2017, is certainly the gold standard. This issue and the ecology goes across all of the east coast of Australia. So having something at a national level would certainly be much, much better. Um, uh, yes, from Libby, some councils in Australia have been holding public education events largely related to habitat restoration projects they're undertaking. It's actually one being held in Wing in Wingham this weekend. Sorry, I'm not sure where that is. Saturday 15th, so get on down to Wingham um, if you're around. Public engagement events held by the local councils and local rescue groups collaboratively have shown success in making the locals aware of how detrimental our flying foxes are. Also, I live in the Byron Shire. The council here are great. They have recently built a skate park adjacent to a flying fox colony with minimal disturbance to the colony. It shows the flying foxes in their natural habitat and is a good example of coexistence. It certainly sounds like an excellent um, example. Uh, we've got three more. So these might be the last three that we take, I think. From Laura, the supposed prevention, oh, excuse me, it's gone a bit. Uh, the supposed prevention dispersal activities during pup raising season seems to be regulated by whoever is contracted to do the dispersal. How can flying fox expertise in that industry be improved? Excellent question, and I'll defer to you for this one, Dom. Oh, look, I think um, councils um, could have access, certainly some of the councils that I've been dealing with, they could have access to expertise if they wanted to use it. Um, but I think that often they don't really want to know more than because they've got to be seen to be doing something and they think that just doing a good old dispersal is going to shut up the locals much more than trying to do something um, a little bit more subtle. But there's something else that I wanted to raise, which I think is really important, is the, the tourism potential of flying foxes, um, which you know is probably which probably needs to be explored a lot more by some councils. Certainly in Charter Stairs, when you go there, um, the locals never go anywhere near the parks, but the you know the, the tourists they'll stop at the park and they'll have a look at the flying foxes and think how amazing they are. Uh, it's just next to a pub, you know, the pub could be using this as an opportunity to be selling the flying foxes, but that's a potential that just simply hasn't been, hasn't been used at all. I think it's a real shame. Yeah, I, I, think you're, I think you're spot on there. And to speak to um, a bit more about the question or the, the comment made around um, how can we, we do that as well. Um, sorry, it's disappeared on me now, so I'm, I'm trying to scramble back at the same time. Um, yeah, it is, it is a good point, and I think a lot of councils are trying to go towards that, and often the reason why they, you know, they go towards these things is because they're not really sure of what else exists, um, and so those expertise are certainly growing. Um, we are becoming uh, more well-connected and certainly sharing those wins, and um, yeah, it's certainly something we can, we can go towards more, and those opportunities for tourism is, is just the next step that we can really try and flip that flip that um and yes this is something very similar to why do they keep going towards it well i would push back a little bit on public sentiment as well um so yes we know that there is all these political push why what is what's the meaning behind that why would there be so much political push and that's you know elected officials are representatives of the people that that have voted them in so 
this is all linking back to why we need to improve our education, improve our outreach, improve understanding so that we can move that groundswell of people towards a tolerance, towards coexistence so that it becomes less fashionable to be doing things that remove trees, for instance, or, you know, are, are trying to disperse threatened species. So I think we, we all certainly do have a part to play as well. It's certainly not just state governments, not, not, not just feds, it's not just local, it's not carers and, and researchers. We certainly all have a part to play in this to really shift that, that discussion towards, well, maybe it's just okay for them to be there and maybe it's okay for us to be here and that's, that's just okay. It really is okay. Um, look, uh, lots of wonderful thank yous coming through um, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, where is the podcast available? would love to listen. It is on absolutely every streaming platform you have. Just search BATPOD, B-A-T-P-O-D, um, and you'll see a beautiful purple icon with a flying fox on it um, and some episodes, but I can certainly post a link as well. Um, were there any final comments from you, Dominique? I thank you very right. much for your time and expertise and everything that you've put forward tonight. It's been a wonderful learning for me and a wonderful experience as well to be a part of. So thank you to the RGSC, RGSQ as well. Um, but thank you to you. And if you have any final remarks. Yeah, thank you very much for RGSQ for having us uh, talking about this. I think it's such an important topic, of course. So it's great to have that. But I think it also, also shows that we have some great connections that we can make between uh, flying fox carers, councils, um, geographers and uh, and government bodies. So I think it's a, it, you know, I'm feeling hopeful. Likewise, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for that. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Thank you again, Tyra and, and Dominique. A fantastic conversation, and I certainly know a hell of a lot more about flying foxes than I did coming into this. Uh, once again, we do have some more events coming up this month and next, including Who Calls Himself a Geographer, Ag and Artificial Intelligence, and our Geography Matters next month about Mount Isa, the first 100 years, and into the future. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this recording will be available very soon via YouTube, and we will send out an email link as well. See you all again at a future event. Thank you.